Welcome to K. Elizabeth Toasts, a podcast celebrating people who increase our quality of life. I'm your host, K. Elizabeth, a licensed counselor, coach, and PhD who is interested in what people do to make others' lives better through the lens of the five social determinants of health. The World Health Organization says these five social determinants can impact up to 55% of our health outcomes. In this episode, our guest shares how they impact the social determinant of access to quality education. Give a listen if you need a dopamine hit, or if you like toast, because this toasts for you. My name is Katie, and I'm married to my wife, and we've got two beautiful boys. And I am currently a behavior certified behavior analyst, which is a specialty that that is uh, able to work with kids with autism or kids who are displaying a variety of um, challenging behaviors. I have been in this field for 25 years, the field of autism for 25 years and have been in a variety of different settings from, you know, early childhood preschool teacher to, I mean, para to teacher to um, uh, early childhood program coordinator to a parent home coach. I was a SPED manager for 10 years. Um, I'm currently in the education system right now working as a, a behavior analyst in working for kids with in classrooms with autism. My passion lies within parent coaching. I'm for public education, but I'm also for parent advocacy so that they know their child inside and out so that they can advocate them from birth through 25, because <laughs> that's what they have to do. How did you get started working with kids with autism? Well, when I went to the University of Kansas back in 1997, 98, I took this behavior modification class. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I took this behavior modification class from um, this professional in the world of applied behavior analysis. His name was Dr. James Sherman. His wife was Jan Sheldon. And he told me this story about a little boy who needed to wear a pair of glasses because if he didn't wear glasses, he would go blind. And so he told this story and the way that he told the story and how they taught this little boy to wear glasses through a process we call shaping, um, that you don't just force glasses on a kid because he's just going to rip them off, but they, they reinforced small approximations to get him to wear it. And it was life changing for this little boy. Like he put his glasses on, he could see like he, and when I heard about that story and I heard about the systematic approach that they had to take, I was like, I want to do that. Um, it also comes from as an early child, like I, I, I think I was eight, nine, 10. My parents were a host family for two twin girls who had cognitive disability. And so they were actually at a home, like a residential facility. And my parents, my sister was an occupational therapist who worked at this residential facility. And there was an opportunity for, for families to take in these kids who didn't have parents. And so I think my sister was like, what do you think about taking these twin girls home? And um, my parents were like, yeah, sure. And so we, they started coming home just on the weekend. You know, my, I'm the youngest of five. And my parents were like, oh, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> bring them on. They started coming. <laughs> bring them on. We got plenty of food. Um, but they started coming home on the weekends. I think it was like 10. And then they came home. They were part of our family. And so that was something that, like, I remember wanting to help them. Like, I remember going to their school and helping them learn. And um, so I think that was a big portion of that. And then when I went to college, it was kind of like all this kind of came together. You know, autism, it just, I don't know, it just sparked an interest in me. And I've I've been doing it ever since. You know, and I came out to Colorado from Kansas in 2006, and I started at this private center for kids with autism. It was called um, the Aspen Center, and this was like a very magical place. It was like a turning point in my life where I learned how to be vulnerable in relationship to people who 
young children who couldn't talk. Like I, they were having tantrums and melting down and I just like connected with the fact that like, I, I can't do anything right now except be here and be with you during this moment. And that was something that we just cultivated amongst the team that I had, um, were these little babies. I mean, they were like two, three, four years old, have autism. They, they couldn't talk and their parents, you know, it's just like, it was just like a, an amazing, magical three years of my life where I learned so much about emotions and connection and parent, parent training. So what do you do? What do I do? So the program, the the school district that I work with, they have a lot of different specific programs that we call center programs for kids with autism. And so typically, I mean, I think we probably have about 27 to 30 different center programs in our district. And this is just one district in Colorado. Um, And there's eight professionals called you know RBCBAs there's eight professionals on my team that we all kind of divide up the autism center programs and we serve about five or six like autism program each and so at each program there's like 10 to 12 students we typically will go into an autism center and provide kind of like behavioral coaching to that teacher oh. I mean we see a lot of kids with autism have some challenging behaviors, whether it's they're not able to communicate their needs or they're confused about the social social situation. And so we're really coaching the teachers and the paras on best practices on how to support that child getting their needs met or um, communicating. But I'm, I'm not, it's, it's confusing because I'm not only in autism centers, I'm also called in if a school has a student that is having Um, a behavior challenge. Kids might be eloping from class, like running away out of classrooms. They might be engaging in some like property destruction, like throwing things. Um, They might be engaging in aggressive behaviors. And so they'll call out a BCBA to observe and provide, whether it be, you know, proactive strategies or, you know, consequence type, what, 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 what things do we need to put in place to support this student? There's a variety of, of things with the current position. Yeah. So when you do go in and work with teachers and provide, you know, behavioral training, what sorts of things are you teaching? The biggest part that I think people don't understand are that every behavior that you run into is communication. There is a function to that behavior of a need not being met. Mm-hmm. A lot of our kiddos can't read. A lot of our kiddos don't like math. And so a variety of behaviors that we that we support are them just not wanting to do work. Like, I don't want to sit here. This is boring. Yeah. I would rather go jump on that trampoline or I'd rather go over here. And so I think what we're trying to teach teachers is giving these kids a voice of saying, I don't want to do this right now. I want to take a break because that replaces the behavior of them just getting up and running away. And so teaching kids to communicate in, in, in ways that I think everyone can understand and to get their needs met, to advocate for their needs of, um, I don't want to do this. I want to take a break. Um, but then also teaching these kids how to work for longer periods of time. They're not like typical learners. Their brains are very different. And so, we have to add in a variety of kinesthetic learning. We have to add in visual learning. We have to provide breaks. We have to help teach them to communicate what they want. We have to help teach that delayed gratification. Like, you can't have this right now, buddy, but we'll help you get it. I think what we're trying to teach is that, I mean, what I'm trying to teach, that just because a child may not have any verbal language, their their needs and their desires are still very valid.
can you think of a time where you could just see a change in someone based upon your interactions and your, your coaching? I think the biggest changes that I see are specifically around communication. Um, and when we're providing opportunities for teachers to accept that the student has a different need. Um, so this one student that I was working with, um, he, he did not want to do anything. Like anytime you tried to ask him to come over or to, you know, do something that was non-preferred for him, he let you know, like a lot of aggression. Um, and, and he's really struggled interacting with people too. Um, he was a young little guy. And I think when I talked to the teacher and the team, it was really just like, what, you know, what does he like to do? Um, and they described a lot of things that he liked to do around the classroom. And so I just kind of said, well, what if we just joined him and taught him within what he was wanting to do? I mean, we couldn't do that all day because we don't have a one-to-one -one support. But when we learned how to just kind of go with his flow, his anxiety came way down. And just like even the presence of people when you would come into his space, I think I think he was just kind of like, what are they going to make me do? And would just like want to get away. Um, or like these people come in and they're the people that take my stuff away. But we reversed that and we said, we're not going to take your stuff away. We're actually going to play with it. And through playing with it, the team actually realized that like, wow, like we're actually teaching a lot of skills. Like we're playing with Mr. Potato Head and we're teaching body parts and we're working on counting and we're working on communication. We don't need to pull you over to a table and make you sit down. That's kind of like, I, I think a profound case because this, this student wasn't really able to, you know, he didn't really know how to learn yet. Instead of like forcing him and in, in, in like having him be aggressive, we just kind of met him where he was at. And I think the team appreciated that because they didn't have to fight behaviors. He was actually learning, but it was a different way. It was out of the box. It was, you know, affirming way of like, this is, this is a different way and we can meet you there. Katie, what keeps you going after 25 years? Where does that passion come from? I mean, these kids, I just love, I love the kids. And when you get a teacher that like wants this kid to succeed, the problem solving and the collaboration is like, it's like, it's, I don't want to call it a puzzle because I know that sometimes puzzle pieces and autism don't fit, but it really is like, what is going to work? What is going to work for this kiddo? Right. Um, what is going to work for this kiddo? Um, I think the problem solving, the collaboration, the idea sharing, if I could spread anything, it would just be that every kid in an autism program is like loved. Like there is part of me that's just like, if they're not learning quite yet, that's okay. They'll get there. But if you can share your love and share your joy and they can share that with you and you see that, that like warms my heart. Because a lot of kids, you know, like if they're nonverbal or they have a hard time communicating, it, if they're not like accepted for who they are and where they are and how they communicate, like it would suck. We have to do better. We have to do better for these kids and for these families. And so I just hope to inspire teachers to like accept these kids exactly where they are. I suspect that your coming in is both welcomed and feared. That, yes. that you're coming in with solutions, but it's um, something to do. That's got to be a tough job, Katie. Yeah. I, I loved that you just said welcomed and feared. I just want to help teachers. But I think having a professional come into your bubble, you know, like there's a level of vulnerability that you have to have there as a professional, there's always this level of vulnerability of like, I, I may, I may need some help here. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's hard for people is just to 
be vulnerable and to know I'm doing my best and my best can get better. And that's, I think that's hard for a lot of teachers because they just want to do their best. And it's a hard balance to make of like, I'm coming in and I want to be your friend, but I also want to move you forward. But I also understand. And I also, you know, like, but I think it's the Brene Brown where she taught, I don't know if it's Brene Brown or someone else, but it's like the other one is radical candor of just like being very present of just like, I care about you and I care about these kids. I need to push you a little out of your comfort zone, but I also need you to know that I, I want to be in relationship with you. Like I'm not, I, I just don't want to be that person that's just like telling people what to do. It's like, I want to demonstrate that I understand you because I've been there. I've been a teacher. I've had all sorts of nights where I've gone home crying. So I know what it's like. But I also am not okay just sitting here, letting things happen, that we have to take small steps to move forward. But it's it's a, it's hard. It's hard with teachers and trying to find that balance as like a professional coach, friend, you know, trusted partner in, in all this feels like a perfect segue to talk about parent coaching. I want to be able to help families of young children with autism become that advocate early on and to learn how to engage and play and communicate with their young child with autism. I, I just want to give them skills that they can play with their kid. Like you can play and you can teach skills. And it's all around play. And so I want to be able to break it down for them so that when they're playing with their kid, they're not only like developing a connection with them, but they're teaching them skills and those skills and help behaviors and those behaviors and help independence. And so it becomes kind of like a domino effect of like when you are, when you can be actively engaged and understand the processes of play, you're affecting so much down the road. You yeah. can have a 15-minute play session and build in 8 to 10 different skills in 15 minutes if you know what you're doing. What sorts of skills are you talking about? So when you think about like early childhood development, you, there is a, a child is going through a variety of different learning opportunities all the time. So if you break it down, you've got, you know, your play skills. You have social skills. You have your communication that's expressive, what, what they're putting out and they're receptive, what they're taking in. You have your gross motor skills. You have fine motor skills. You have independence. Um, you have academic cognitive skills. And so knowing all, not all, but like when I am doing bubbles with my child, if he is a late talker, I can work on expressive communication, uh, shared attention, shared enjoyment. Oh, we're going to open up these bubbles. I go slowly. Um, you know, he's asking for help. I take it out. What should we do? He, should we blow? We're working on imitation. We blow the bubbles. We share enjoyment and excitement and we're, we're in tune to each other. I put the bubbles back in. I turn the lid and I put the bubbles down. And we do that 10 or 15 times. And he hands me the bubbles. I take the, but what should we do? Oh, open? You need help? Help open? Oh, it's hard to, oh, you know, like with bubbles. And then you add, and then you add in Play-Doh or you add in bowling or... You know, some of our kids with autism don't play with toys. And so teaching them that, like, we have to then teach parents of, like, my kid just lines things up or he just rolls things back and forth across his eyes and he doesn't want to play. Well, I know how you can get in. I know how to get in to then play and build. Um, and so I, I think sometimes, you know, I think parents just may not know the variety of skills within that early childhood development of like, how are we breaking all these things down? Communication, advocacy, socialization, motor, independence. There's so much that is in just like a single segment of play. 
was a fantastic example. Thank you so much for that. Also, I now want to go blah blah balls. <laughs> I know they're so fun. They really are fun. <laughs> Before I do a toast to you, I wondered if you would take a moment and think about someone who has impacted your life in a positive way, and if you would be willing to call them out and do a toast to them. I mean, my, I think when I moved out to Colorado, my mentor, her name is Helen Nitschka, and she lives here in Colorado. She is a speech language pathologist and she still works with kids with autism. Um, she is someone who I learned so much about the emotional connection with young children who may not have mm. the skills yet to connect back. Yeah. Um, working side by side with Helen changed my life, changed the trajectory of how I see kids and and just like her infectious just laugh and just joy for um, and, and realness. She just was such a real joyful coach. Cheers to Helen. Cheers to Helen. Brad, uh, who's in season one, by the way, he recommended you to be a guest and he shared some words that I wanted to share with you. Katie serves kids with autism and other disabilities that should be represented. She's one of the most courageous, compassionate people I've ever worked with. Oh, make me cry. Katie, for helping parents and teachers to find the voice of their child, for teaching parents and teachers how to play with their child and how to love their child in a way that their child can feel that love for unconditionally loving the children that you work with and for being willing to put yourself in that vulnerable position where you may be sharing information with someone who may not want it or may not have the capacity to take it in at that time but continuing to advocate for the child so that they can learn and grow for 25 years of service <laughs> to our children. This toast is for you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Now it's your turn. Honor someone who has made your life better by recommending them as a guest or by recording a toast to them at ketoasts.com. To positively impact my life and to keep us going, tap the follow button, rate us using a star button, and share this episode with someone who could use some good news. Then, go toast up some bread. Because every positive action is worth toasting.